Greetings, my friends. My following guest is Dr. Christopher McIntosh. He prefers to just be called Chris. He earned his doctorate from the auspicious Ox his doctorate in history from the auspicious Oxford University. Today, we're discussing his book *Occult Russia*, which is a fascinating book in its own right, um, but a book that was particularly fascinating to me because of how it aligns with um, things that I've read from other thinkers, such as Edgar Casey, and in a book that I am very fascinated with the secret of history of the world by mark booth um these various these various pipelines of uh spiritual thinking have uh foreseen that over the course of this um this evolution of human consciousness or human spirituality however you prefer to frame it that russia is going to play a very special role at some point now obviously right now russia is tangled up in all kinds of political intrigue this conversation has nothing to do with that. This isn't about the government of Russia, per se. It's about the people of Russia. It's about the traditions of Russia, the spiritual lineage of Russia, and uh, various things that are going on now, various things that happened in the past, such as Rasputin um, back in the day, and then coming into the modern age, we're talking about the way that um, Orthodox Christianity and paganism overlaps in very interesting ways <clears throat> in Russia today. You have movements such as the Ringing Cedars movement, which is a, a very interesting uh, movement that's happening right now. So, um, yes, the way that all of these uh, various threads interlace had me particularly interested in the contents of this book. It's, uh, it's just a fascinating book. And, um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. And uh, I hope you enjoy this interview. I did very much. Um, Chris is a... Very, he's a man full of interesting insights and knowledge, and you're going to hear things in the following interview that you're not going to hear anywhere else because not many people outside of Russia have spent this much time really scrutinizing the esoteric, occult, spiritual traditions of Russia. So that's about it. Thank you very much, my friends. I hope you're all having uh, great days, great weeks. Great months, great years, and I hope you have a great year coming up because we've got 2023 is right around the corner. I think it's going to be a banger. All right. Peace out, my friends. All right, Chris, thank you very much for taking the time to speak today. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, sir. So, all right. Spent a lot of time, read your book, spent a lot of time thinking about it, took a, a ton of notes. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, the book is so full of fascinating stories and ideas that there's the temptation to hop over every one of those and kind of do like a tour de force sampling of everything. But you also tie everything together with very definitive archetypal patterns and themes and philosophical concepts. And I want to focus more on that because I, I think that's really the meat of the book is I walked away from the book with a very, um, well, relative to somebody who had no base before, but a pretty solid sense for the Russian spiritual thinking tradition history. And yeah. that's really more of what I want to focus on. And so in these archetypal patterns, in these philosophical themes that run through the ideas, it yeah. seems to me that the real, the kernel of it, or at least one of the core ideas, is the millenarian concept. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I practice saying that word getting ready for this interview. I don't know why it's such a difficult word to pronounce. But um, so could you discuss generally the millenarian idea um, just as a general concept and then specifically? its role and its importance in the Russian spiritual um, tradition. Yes. Well, the, this millenarian idea is very deeply rooted uh, in the Russian soul. And I think it probably goes back to the time when, the, <clears throat> when Russia adopted the Orthodox religion, when um, Russia began to see itself as the third Rome, as they, as they called it. Um, the first Rome being the one on the Tiber, the second being Constantinople, and the third being Russia. So they saw themselves as a, a, in, in a way as the, um, the, 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 as, as the replacement of the, um, the two pre, pre, previous Romes. As, as, as the um, as a sort of spiritual spiritual leader of the world, mm. and um, this um, idea has stayed with them, and um, 
it's taken various forms. Um, the, <clears throat> there is the classic, um, the sort of classic um, apocalyptic scenario, um, which is a very, very common theme in, in Russia. So you have um, a time when the, the Antichrist or the beast comes, um, as in Revelation, Mm -hmm. and um, institutes a reign of, a reign of evil um, until he's defeated by a savior who um, uh, in, in, in some, sometimes he's seen as um, Christ returned or in some cases as um, what the Russians call the woman clothed, clothed with the sun. Uh, this is a kind of Sophia figure um, Sophia being the um, feminine aspect of the Logos. And um, this Sophia figure is very um, prominent in, uh, in, in the, Russian, the Russian psyche. Um, well, she, she's already prominent in, in the Orthodox religion because, for example, the great church in Constantinople was dedicated to Sophia. Um, and she's, she's remained um, a very powerful figure in, in Russian tradition. Hmm. Um, so and <clears throat> so that's, a, that's another, another sort of millenarian theme. Um, and the, ex the ex expectation of a new age runs right through Russian history, right up to the present day. Um, I, mean the, I mean, Marxism was, was in a way... A, a kind of apocalyptic doctrine because um, you, you had the, the, the this dialectic of history which which Marx got from Hegel basically uh, which which ends in the, the triumph of the, the proletariat um, and the, the ushering in of, of a perfect communist society mm. um, it's, 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 it's nearly always a threefold process. So you, you have the the, um, the the reign the, the reign of the Antichrist, and then the return of the re return of Christ or some other savior, and then then a, a new golden age. Hmm. Um, so um, this is something that crops up again and again, and um, as I, as I say, it's still there. Hmm. In, in the um, so in the concept, you also discuss in the book how, and this is something that actually just occurred to me, <clears throat> but you discuss how they view time generally yeah. as like cyclical as opposed to a, a steady line of, of progression. And what you're just saying about the uh, the Marxism um, kind of seeing is somewhat like a millenarian idea in communism itself. Mm. It sounds like they, they were looking at that, though, as a straight line, because they were looking at it as once the working class wins, it's over. And from that point on, it's paradise uh, forever, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. So well, do you think, does that contradict their usual theme of thinking? Well, well I, I, I think there are, there are really two, two strains here, two different strains. Okay. Uh, one, one is the, um, the straight line theory. Um, and the, the, the advent of um, a, a, a paradisical state or the, the second coming or, or whatever. Um, the other one is, the, as you say, the cyclical view, which is more the pagan view, actually. And um, there, is a, there is a pagan strain in the Russians as well. Uh, and there's... There's always been a sort of tension be between these two, between the orth Orthodox Christian religion and the pagan religion. And um, for a long time, well, I, in fact, um, right, up to, right up to now, um, these two have managed to live, managed to coexist um, in a sort of modus vivendi, although the the church has never looked very kindly on, on paganism, but somehow they, they managed to coexist. And um, there are many people 
who have a foot in both camps. Um, it's, it, it's, it's called dual belief, dvoyeveria in, in Russian, um, where people would go to church on Sunday, but at the same time they would, they would celebrate the, the pagan festivals and um, you know, make, make offerings to the pagan gods and so on. Um, and um, there's now, many Russians are now um, turning to these pre-Christian pagan beliefs. And there's, so there's, there's quite a big pagan movement in, in Russia. Yeah, that, that was really fascinating to me because I, yeah. I, I see a lot of people discuss the um, resurgence and the interest in orthodoxy. Yeah. Um, I don't hear so much the people talk about the pagan resurgence. No, it's, it's, not, it's not so much publicized, but, it, but it's definitely there. Um, I mean, one form that it takes is people going to prehistoric sites. Like um, there's, there's one called Arkaim in the Urals, which is sort of the equivalent of Stonehenge, a Russian equivalent of Stonehenge. And um, people flock there at midsummer. There's thousands of people flock there in midsummer to um, s celebrate midsummer, rather as they do at Stonehenge. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> there, are, there are other sites um, where, where, which attract similar numbers of of people hmm. and um, you know there are there are people who um, celebrate uh, pagan weddings pagan burials uh, so pa pagan rites of passage and so on hmm. yeah that is it that part interested me about the um the belief in the old like lost civilizations because Right now, no. Graham Hancock is doing a series in Netflix that has everybody in the United States talking about this idea that yeah. we don't we don't understand ancient history as much as we think we do, and there were yeah. all of these things that happened, and so it's really interesting to me that happening at the same time in Russia, yeah. there are these stories and people who are taking very seriously the idea that there's yes. like a lost history. Yes. Yes. Well, well, this this ties in with um, another another of those arch archetypes. Um, I, <coughs> these archetypes are very powerful in Russia. You could you could call them egregores. Mm. Uh, eg egregore being a, a thought form created by many people thinking the same thoughts and focusing on the same symbols and ideas. Um, and um, I think the reason for that is that, if, if you like, the veil between the real everyday world and the, the, the etheric world of the spirit is much thinner in Russia than, than in other places, which means that the, the, collective, the collective archetypes are much stronger and, and um, people have a much closer access to them. Hmm. And one, one of them is, um, is this idea of the, the Never Never Land, the, um, the par paradise over the hills and far away, um, inaccessible except to those who, who are worthy to find it. And um, one of these um, Never Never Lands is, it's called Bielovodje, the land of the white waters. And um, many people actually believe that this, this uh, Bielovodje existed mm. or, or still exists. Um, another one is Hyperborea, um, literally that the name means beyond the north wind, Boreas be the north wind. Um, and um, there was a theory that there was um, an advanced civilization in the far north, in the the Arctic region before before the Arctic region became covered by ice, mm. and there was a the kind of um, temperate zone in the middle of the ice where where there was this civilization, 
um, of the Hyperboreans. And um, there's, a, there's a strong movement in Russia that um, believes that the Russians are the inheritors of the, the Hyperboreans. They, they are, in a way, the heirs of the Hyperboreans. Hmm. And there's a, there's a whole school of painting um, with um, extraordinary scenes of um, uh, Hyperborean landscapes and ports and um, people um, traveling about in sleighs drawn by reindeer, or drawn by mammoths. Um, and uh, some, of these, some of these paintings are quite remarkable. Right. Yeah, I thought so. I I actually looked up some of the artists that you mentioned in there. I'm trying to find prints of the work that I could buy it buy from my yeah. house. It's really neat stuff. Yeah. Mm. So the people who um subscribe to this uh, hyperborea idea are they more on the orthodox side or on the pagan side? Uh, I would say rather more on the pagan side. Oh, okay, but, but not exclusively. Hmm. Mm. And something in discussing these these ideas, like you talk about um, the the millenarian concept that we you just discussed, yeah. some of these general ideas. Something I want um, viewers to understand is that these things go way back in Russia, but they're still active today. That was one of the things I found most interesting. Yeah. Um, you discuss this in the one chapter, Russia as an Ark. Yes. You, yes. Um, yeah, you discussed the Izborsky Club, which yeah. So they're essentially they believe that the flood that there is a new biblical flood that's happening, but this flood is a flood of information and ideas and yeah, right. kind of like mental confusion. And yes, yes. Russia has a special place in the world as an arc against this. And yeah, exactly. Yes. Right. And this club is not, this isn't random people like teenage kids practicing Wicca or something. These are influential people. So yeah. Yeah. Could you this talk is, about that briefly. Yeah. This is um, a group of group of conservative intellectuals. Um, many of them, um, who regret the passing of the Soviet Union. Hmm. Um, but they're a, they're a great mixture. There are as orthodox clergy among them, um, writers, philosophers, um, all, all kinds of people. And um, basically, they, as, you, as you say, they see this approaching flood of um, information overload and a kind of dehumanizing process um, and they see this this really as coming from the west this flood um, so they they um, they want to promote a, a, a sort of revival of spiritual values and um, yeah so so they see Russia as leading this this revival hmm. That's, it's fascinating because right now in various corners of the internet and um, just general media and people who are concerned about such things, I've noticed there's been like a real resurgence in kind of theosophical ideas, um, which kind oh, yeah. of kind of loop into this, except that <laughs> these people don't assume Russia is going to be the answer. They don't really have Russia as a special place in it. No, but no. this concept of um, this confusion and kind of madness, yeah, it's going to lead to some kind of like spiritual rebirth. I see that everywhere. So it's really yeah. interesting to me that it's also happening in Russia at the yes. same time. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so one of the most interesting things that's happening right now is the rising cedars or the ringing cedars movement. And uh, oh yes, yes, and the anesthesia yeah. movement, uh, which. I have so many questions about that, but could could you talk briefly about the story of Anastasia and then the uh, the ringing cedars? Yes. Well, um, there's a Russian former businessman called Vladimir Megra, uh, who was back in the 1990s. He was um, traveling on a ship on a business trip down the river Ob from Novosibirsk um, down to the Arctic Ocean. And um, at one point, 
he stopped in a village, and well, this is his story. I mean, a lot, a lot of people say that this is that this is fiction, right? But this but this is his story. So he stopped in a village, and there he met this woman called Anastasia, who was um, a kind of priestess. She was a a beautiful, radiant, radiant woman who lived in a cave in a forest. And uh, she took him off to this cave where he spent several days with her. And during this time, she imparted to him a whole teaching, basically about how to live a, a more wholesome life in greater harmony with, with nature. And um, he, he then he went back to Moscow and gave up his business career and wrote a book about what she had told him. That was the, the first of um, a series of books uh, on the Anastasia teachings. And um, the, this book became a bestseller mm. uh, and, and the, the following ones in the series. And... Well, to, to cut a long story short, um, it gave rise to a whole movement, and it it it, it, it centers around a um, it centers around the concept of homesteads of two acres each, self sufficient homesteads uh, grouped into communities, and there's a whole kind of um, teaching and way, way of life that goes with it about um, you know, how, to, how, to, how to grow crops, how to raise your family, how to live um, a happier and, and more harmonious life, basically. And um, so this, this really took off. Um, many, many of these settlements have been founded, uh, not only in Russia, but in other countries as well. Hmm. Um, so, as, as I say, um, it, the, the, these, these Anastasia books are, are often treated as fiction. Um, other, other people think that they are, that they are fact. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, the interesting question is, who is Anastasia? Does she, is she a real person? Does she exist? Um, I mean, she, he, she's never been, he's never actually produced her. Mm. Um, what, what I think is that this is another manifestation of the, 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 the egregore of the woman clothed with the sun. Uh, it's another, another variation of that. And, um, I was going to ask you that exact question. That passage in the book where you said that um, you thought – you, you throw out the idea. Yeah. That it could have actually been a manifestation, even possibly a physical manifestation, which I found fascinating. I, but, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to say I was <laughs> going to ask you about that because I was so fascinated by that. Yeah, well, I think um, what, what happened was that he plugged into this archetype um, and sort of brought, yeah, um, made it manifest, as it were, in some way. Mm. Yeah, man, that is, an, that is a really, really fascinating. I was just reading about Edgar Cayce, I guess, later in his life. He, he had right. talked about this, um, this ethereal being, but apparently later in his life when he was going through a lot of struggles, mm -hmm. witnesses swear that they saw this person physically manifest and walk up to him and supposedly have bowed to him um, in recognition of the suffering that he was going through to get Oh, really? Yeah. But yeah. Yes. And so um, when I read that part in your book, it just reminded me of that Casey story. And I thought that was yeah. a really neat idea. Yes. yes. Well, 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 of course, there's the, the Tibetan concept of the Tulpa, um, who is um, a kind of egregore, um, sum, summoned up, who actually takes a, a physical form, phys form of a physical human being. Hmm. Uh, Alexandra David Neal, in her book about Tibet, um, she she relates that um, she actually created one of these beings. Really? In, yeah, in, in the wow. form of in the form of a, a monk who appeared in a, in a sort of a brown uh, robe, and um, 
then then she couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> so how did how did she remedy that? Well, then she had, she had to do some sort of elaborate ritual to to get rid of him. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty intense. Well, that's yeah, like, I remember a, a Spensky, I believe he claimed that Gurdjieff actually physically appeared to him when Gurdjieff was like a thousand miles away. And that, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I, I, if I remember correctly, there was some story where he said he physically materialized in a train, which obviously wouldn't be quite the same thing because Gurdjieff was a real, he wasn't a tulpa, he was a living person, but yes. still kind of the same same concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's that's pretty wild stuff. And so the um, yeah, the the woman clothed the woman clothed in the sun, clothed with the sun. Yes, it's, it comes from comes from Revelation, right? And, and that is did did there is there any evidence of that archetype of the woman clothed in the sun predating the Bible? Or no, I guess that that wouldn't even make sense because they don't they didn't have recorded history beyond that point, right? No. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So that wouldn't even make sense. But it, it appears it appears all over, all over the place. Um, for, for example, during the war, um, during the, the German when the Germans invaded Russia, um, Stalin realized that he needed some very powerful symbol to, un, to unite the Russians against the Germans, and he, he realized that the, the communist ideology wasn't enough. That, that couldn't ignite the, the patriotism of the Russians. So um, he brought in this figure of Mother Russia. Uh, and um, there was a, a slogan that said, um, Mother Russia calls. And everywhere there were these posters that appeared with this heroic looking woman with a, with a sword raised and, the, and this slogan, Mother Russia calls. So, so again, this is, this is another another manifestation of the same egregore. Hmm. Yeah, something, it, it, I, I came away from your book, um, one of the things you didn't explicitly touch upon it, but I found really interesting was how deliberately and consciously the power structures in Russia tried to use religion and um, philosophy to shape people's perceptions and in, in the way that they live, which is probably true of all societies throughout all time but still yeah, yeah. as you go over it, it it was really stunning how consciously they thought about like well now let's tweak this idea in order to achieve this result from the masses yes yes, yes. well i think um, there, there is a sense in which people act uh, act, act out a kind of um, mythic story Kind of ep epic story. Um, the, I mean, when when you think, for example, of national heroes like like Alexander Nevsky, there's there's there's, um, there's very often a, a pattern to their lives where they they um, they start a movement, they gather followers, and then they have a period of failure when they they, they maybe go off into exile. And then they come back and um, reassemble their followers and, and then are victorious. Mm. And, um, so this is, this is a common pattern in these, in these epics. And I think there is a sense in which people actually act out in reality, but maybe, con maybe unconsciously. Mm. Um, so I, th I think, um, you know, figures like, like Stalin, I think, are, are probably doing that. Hmm. It helped along, possibly, by the psychic currents of the entire yeah, nation, yeah. right? Yeah, like exactly, exactly, yes. It kind of becomes an avatar for their yeah, own yeah. type of thinking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and I think, I think these, these avatars are, are particularly strong in Russia, Um because, uh, as, as I said, I think that they're much they're much closer to the this what, what you might call the spiritual realm, where these these avatars are present. Hmm. That, that's a, that's a really interesting idea that even it's not yeah. just uh, it's not just a cultural difference that 
<clears throat> maybe people that are actually exposed to different environment uh, at the most deep and fundamental level yeah. uh, to where their experience is literally different than ours. Like that's, that's a really mind blowing concept. Yeah. And, uh, I, uh, and anyone who goes to Russia, uh, <clears throat> anyone who, any observant person who goes to Russia uh, becomes aware of this. Um, I mean, the, the poet Rilke, for example, who uh, was very enamored of Russia and regarded it as a spiritual home, he, he said something like that um, Russia was the only country where, um, th through which God still connect was still connected to the earth. Hmm. Um, and I think there's quite a lot of truth in that. Right. Yeah, some time back, I um, I did a little interview with my Russian tutor and um, yes. asked her a lot of questions. And I was really struck when I was talking about esoteric topics, because here, if I mention that to anybody, you got kind of get the look, you know, like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, right. but she re responded like it was totally normal. Like she yeah. her own interest wasn't that deep, but she didn't find it peculiar that I am into. Like she didn't find yeah. it weird at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was really uh, interesting. And also she was one of the, she, she had fonder, mem fonder ideas of Stalin, the time of Stalin, than I thought anybody would. It, it kind of oh. harks back to what you said earlier about some portions of the society kind of miss the Soviet thing. Yes. That's kind of what, basically what she was saying as well. Oh, yeah. yes. Really interesting. Yes, yes. And so and speaking of the Russian language. Mm, yeah. So uh, I think one of my favorite parts of the book, because I'm studying the Russian language, I love the Russian mm -hmm. language, is where you talk about the the mystic roots, yes, the, yes. The, tonal, the tonal qualities of the language. Could you yes, expand yes, on yes. that a little bit? Yeah, well, the tonal qualities um, in the it's an, a language that's ideally suited to the Orthodox liturgy, and um, in in the Orthodox liturgy, everything seems to be sort of an, an octave lower than in the Western Catholic or Protestant liturgy. So it, um, it sort of ac activates different chakras. And um, this is one of the things that makes the Orthodox liturgy so powerful. Mm. But um, the, the language, I mean, it's, um, it's an Indo-European language, which means it's related to Sanskrit. And you can see the you you can see much more clearly than other, in other European languages how how it's related to Sanskrit. I mean, there's there's a story about a Russian uh, an Indian professor who was visiting Russia. I think I think back in the 1950s and uh, visiting a family in Russia and. Um, one woman from this family was taking taking him, him round a village, and she she pointed to a house and she said, um, "That's our house." Uh, in Russian, um, "Это наш дом." Mm. And he was astonished because he said, "It's almost that would be almost the same in Sanskrit." Really? Something, something like "Это наш дом," and. Um, other 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 words and phrases, and so he he at one point he 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 thought he was listening to Sanskrit when in fact he was listening to Russian. Wow! So it's it's um it it it, um, so it has very very ancient roots the, the language and um, very beautiful beautiful language for poetry for example has. Um, enormous flexibility as, as a language. You can say things. You can you can say things poetically in in Russian that you can't say in in other languages. Hmm. So you you mentioned um, in our pre our email correspondence that you had started to read Dead Souls by Gogol. Gogol, did yeah. you read it? Uh, are you reading it in Russian? <laughs> yeah. Or? No, I'm, I'm 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 being lazy. I'm reading it in English. 
Oh yeah, it's actually one of my goals to read it in Russian eventually. But I'm I'm no I've been studying the language for a couple of years, but I'm nowhere near I could read a novel. It would take me a couple of years to, to read a Russian novel right now. <laughs> oh. Well, it's it's a very intriguing book. And I'm I'm really glad you think so because that's it's if I could think of all the books I've read that have most just stuck in my mind, that would be in the top ten. It's been in my mind since I read it when I was a kid. Mm. Well, it, it has this, it has this very Russian mixture of sort of gloom and, and melancholy and and, um, and cynicism, com- combined with absolutely hilarious humour. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I found myself laughing almost <laughs> at many passages in it. But um, I, 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 I was also aware that that there is an a deeper level. There's, 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 there are sort of esoteric um, levels in it. Um, I mean, he, he talks about, for example, one of the characters in it reading um, a book by the German mystic Eckhartshausen. And um, there's, there's another character um, who has a, a little temple on his estate with, with a sign that says that the temple of solitary contemplation um, so there's, there's, there's some, something going going on there which may <clears throat> may become clearer to me as I as I read on through the book that, that's very validating for me because like I said I, I had this sense that there's something at work in that book and I just wasn't sure what it was and I've never yeah. met anybody else who read it before so uh, um, thank you for the validation making me feel like less of a crazy person <laughs> <laughs> but um have you read any uh, of other Gogol's any of Gogol's no. Any novels no I haven't no, no. I, I, feel this is the only one I've read. I feel inspired to do so now yeah I I want to read uh Petersburg that you discuss in your book oh yes that's an extraordinary book extraordinary yeah. novel yeah mm. that's that's we're probably going to be the next uh fiction mm. that I take on mm. Um, so you mentioned early, actually, you know what is an interesting thing. Um, so the Bolshevik revolution, Yeah. you talk in your book about how, um, you know, they made great efforts to drive out any kind of spirituality, yeah. but the esoteric community actually managed to survive for some time and actually produce some materials. So could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting story. Um, there were various esoteric and occult groups that continued after the Bolshevik Revolution and um, pretty much up to the advent of Stalin uh, and, and, and even a, a bit after. Um, there was, for example, a Rosicrucian group um, of which the film director Eisenstein was a member which um, I found very surprising because it's not something that one would associate with Eisenstein, but uh, he was a member of that group. And uh, there were, well, there were people who were interested in the tarot. There, there was a man called uh, Miobis who was um, a, um, who, who created a, a book on the tarot and ran, ran a little group, ran a little tarot group. I think in Moscow, um, but um, the, the police found out about it and arrested the members, and I think most of them died in the gulag. Mm. Um, and um, when the, the the Stalinist terror really got going, um, the, these these groups were pretty much annihilated, and so by the by the end of the war, there was virtually no esoteric scene except perhaps uh, very much in secret, a few small groups. Mm. But, but then um, when things eased up a bit uh, after Stalin's death and um, when, when Khrushchev started um, reforming the system a bit, they, they um, started coming, coming out again and um, slowly, um, slowly, slowly, slowly becoming active again. So then there were 
there were Gurdjieff groups and theosophical groups and, and so on. Um, so a, a bit cautiously at first, but, but they, got, they got stronger and, and more active as time went on. Hmm. Then, then, of course, after um, Gorbachev and, and Perestroika, they really started to flourish again. Yeah, it's, it's amazing reading um, that part of the book because I feel like it ties into this theme, this curious aspect of Russian people, which is this, you talk about how um, they hold faith as more important than logic. And um, that, that was just a little, a little part in, in uh, one of your paragraphs. But just your point was faith to them is this, uh, they perceive it as something much more like almost tangible and in forceful than we yes, see. yes yes well you, you, you can see that in the in the Orthodox Church I mean um, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an Orthodox Christian myself but I, I sometimes go to Orthodox services and there's, there's something inc- incredibly powerful there I mean it just um, hits you as soon as you go in hmm. and uh, and I mean they've They've, they have a strength that they've acquired by going through enormous suffering. Um, I, I, you could say that, 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 the, that Russia is sort of like a, a sword that's been forged in, in an intensely hot furnace hmm. and, and, and come, out, come out immensely strong. I mean, any, any people who... When, when you think of the, the horrific rulers they've had, like I, I, Ivan the Terrible, and um, the enormous suffering that they've gone through, famines and wars and whatnot, and the, the, the Stalinist terror and the German invasion. I mean, and, any people who can go, go through all that and um, come out of it um, must be immensely strong. Right. Yeah, it, it's um, very. It's interesting to me because something that I want um, viewers to realize too is that Russians have their own perspective on this, but it's not isolated to the Russians because I've read like the Secret History of the World by Mark Booth, and mm-hmm. various other sources. All I think Edgar Casey was one of them, um, or maybe it was Steiner, one of them. But a lot of people have said that Russia has this special place. Yeah. Um, in, in the future, uh, and by special place, we mean for the <clears throat> evolution of human consciousness or spirituality, however any given yeah. person prefers yeah. to frame it. But it's not isolated to Russia. There are many spiritual thinkers throughout history who said that Russia is going to play this very special role. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One, one, of the, one of the most interesting predictions um, was made by the German historian Oswald Spengler, who said that um, he was writing around the 1920s, um, and he said that Bolshevism was basically a phase that was going to clear the way, to clear the way for, for something new. Mm-hmm. And I think I think he he put it some something like something like this that um, it was going to clear the way for a new civilization that was going to emerge between Europe and Asia. And um, in, in a way, that's already happening because you, you've got this Eurasian movement in Russia. Yeah, that, that part, uh, that was another one I wanted to ask you about. That, that Eurasian yeah. concept is... Yeah, uh, the idea of the language, like actually tying people together in some like fundamental level like almost yeah. like the egregore is defined by language and, and defined by national identity um is that what you're referring to with the eurasian well, well the, the the language um the, the various the various um peoples living within russia um encompass many many different languages not not just russian but but many 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 languages oh, right right uh, but um the, the Eurasian idea, um, well, one, one of the problems that Russia has always had is how to integrate these 
these different nationalities, these different peoples um, in, into Russia itself. And um, during the communist era, there was a, a debate um, because, well, how, how are we going to deal with the nationalities? The, that, that, that was the question. Because the, the, according to the, the orthodox Marxist view, um, the, these, um, nation, these nationalities and um, local patriotism, local cultures and, and all that, that was all going to fade away in the glorious communist hmm. world that was going to emerge. Because basically all of humanity is, is progressing according to the laws discovered by Marx. But then, well, then it became clear that this, this was an illusion, that you, 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 can't, you can't get rid of these local cultures um, with, with their, their centuries-old traditions and their languages and customs and so on. So um, how, were they going to, uh, how were they going to create um, sort of an overall unity? And... This, this was why this, this um, Eurasian movement ca came into being, because it was a way of creating a concept that could um, bring together all of these, these, these nationalities within the Russian sphere. Hmm. All right. In the, um, oh, I, I had a really good question, and I completely lost my train of thought. Hmm. The, oh, okay. So... In thinking of this, in this this Russian identity and yeah. possible role that Russia is going to play in the future, yeah. uh, according to these various prophecies and prophetic individuals, mm -hmm. one question I keep having is that it is a recurring theme, unfortunately for the Russian people because they're the victims of it, but mm -hmm. the authoritarian rule seems to just be this thing that pops up in Russia all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. And it makes me curious, and now we're getting into the realm of uh, uh, theorizing or just imagining, yeah. but assuming, assuming that it's correct, that yeah. Russia is going to remain like our touchstone to the spiritual, um, which is my interpretation of what it, like Russia as an arc is. Yeah. Uh, this idea that as the world be is lost in this Tower of Babel madness of ideas, that Russia is going to be our, our core, the thing that holds us to the spiritual center and helps the world. And I try to think, like, is that going to happen independently of its own seeming archetypal association with authoritarianism? Or is authoritarianism part of the vision? Well, I think it's one of those... It's one of those archetypes. It's one, it's one of those egregores. Um, <clears throat> I mean, when you think of the rulers they, they've had, I think the, the, the strong authoritarian and sometimes brutal ruler is, is one of those archetypes. It's one of, one of those egregores that um, keep, keep coming up. Um, when, you, <clears throat> when you think of Ivan the Terrible, for example, who was... Uh, really, a monster, you know, in in, in his cruelty. Right. But um, when when he threatened when he threatened to abdicate, um, all his nobles went to him and said, "Oh no, please, please don't do that. Please, please stay on." Uh, mm. So, in some way, in, in some curious way, he was he was re revered, although he was so cruel, mm. and. Um, I, there was a, there's a famous Eisenstein film, uh, Ivan the Terrible. Um, and I think in, in a way, Stalin was sort of acting out that, consciously or, or unconsciously, he was, he was acting out a similar sort of uh, egregore. Hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, hope, I hope if they are correct, and I hope if Russia does have this special place, I hope they leave that part behind. <laughs> I hope they get rid of that, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> but, um, okay. And so, oh, the, the Book of Vellus? Oh, yes. Well, that's an interesting story. Um, Vellus is 
one of the old Russian gods. He's um, he's sort of um, he's sort of the equivalent of Pan, really, in the in the classical tradition. He's he's a, a nature god, and um, so well the the, the the background to the book is there was a uh, during the the Russian Civil War there was a colonel of the White Army called Eisenbeck, um, and at, at one point. He and his uh, he and he and his troop came upon a, a country house, and in this country house, the the country house had been sort of wrecked and, and looted. But there was one thing he found in the house, which was um, um, a, a sort of book in the uh, in the form of wooden boards, and um, on these wooden boards was written. What, what um, appeared to be an account of kind of um, e epic account of the, uh, the the old Russian gods, and uh, this is the, the story. Again, again, it may not be true. It may the whole thing may be a fabrication, but this this was uh, what was what was maintained. Um, so Eisenbeck then. Took the took this book, and um, after various wanderings, he ended up in the the, the um, community of Russian expatriates in Brussels, and there he met another another Russian expatriate called Miro Lyubov, and um, he allowed Miro Lyubov to make a transcription of this book, which which took a very long time because he had to do it. Um, to, um, he was only allowed access to it, to it for short periods. Anyway, Miro Lyubov um, made this transcription. It was, it was written, the, the book was written in a curious kind of runic, runic like, rune like script. And um, so Miro Lyubov made a transcription and um, he sent it, or he, he well, it. To cut a long story short, it ended up being published in um, an expatriate Russian journal in San Francisco called, called The Firebird. And um, it, it, it was then um, transmitted back to Russia and a Russian, Russian, a Russian edition was published. And... Um, in recent in recent years, it's 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 become a great bestseller, and um, it, it um, because it, it it answers to that to that Russian sort of quest for that that um, ser searching back in in the Russian past to to find their their roots, and and so so this this. Book answers to that need, um, but it's a, a lot. A lot of people think it's it's a forgery, but many people think it's genuine. Hmm. But it, it contains it contains various sort of contradictions and um, anachronisms. Um, but on on the other hand, that the other other things in it that indicate that it might be genuine, or it might be part genuine and part forgery. Um, hmm. uh, we don't know, but it's it's an intriguing story. I definitely want it to be true because it's, it's really yeah. really interesting. Um, yeah. Even just the backstory to how the book came into being itself yes. is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So um, here we actually. All right, and so in the book, you also talk about. Something that I found very uh, peculiar. There's a section in the book. I think maybe you're quoting somebody else, but either way, it runs along the, mm. the ideas that you were dealing with. You're talking about how, like, there was a time when the Russian Russian men would take the crucifix off a woman before they slept with them, and oh, yeah, yeah, they would yeah. cover the icons in the room, and like thieves would get down. 
and pray no. to icons no. before yeah. stealing something. Yes. And, um, that is so interesting to me. And I was curious um, what you think that indicated to their general paradigm. And if you think that that current runs through in some level to the Russian spirit, even today, because that part of the book was talking about, I think the 1800s or something like that. Yeah. Um, whether that current runs through to today, um, I think that it's hard to say. Um, I think that 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 shows how. I mean, the fact that that a thief would ask God's forgiveness before committing a theft. I mean, that's that shows how deeply rooted the the, the Orthodox religion is um, in, in the Russian soul. How how, pow how powerful it is. Um, and it's 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 still it's still powerful today. Hmm. But you mean the, the sort of tension between the tension between sexuality and, and religion? Is is that what you were? Yeah, yeah. I guess um, I guess the question that arises in my mind is why not just not sleep with a woman? Like if you feel like it's something that you have to hide and that you have to go through this procedure for. Um, it's almost like there's a fatalistic acceptance that you're going to commit the sin yeah, while yeah. still holding on to the faith that yes. can be forgiven. Yes, yes. Would you say that's accurate? Um, yeah, I mean, I have a, I have a chapter on, uh, a chapter in the book on um, sexuality. And yes. How, uh, and... Um, it's a, it's a sort of a, it's a complex um, it's a complex complex subject. Um, ba basically, the Russians are a, a very passionate people, um, and um, but for for a, for a long time they had no culture of of um, sort of romantic love the the, the, the way that such as had, has existed in the West. They didn't have this this culture, the culture of courtly love and all that. They 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 didn't have that, and um, until the nineteenth century, and then um, writers started, started started writing about it and write, writing quite openly about about uh, sexuality. Um, so uh, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of lost, lost the thread. <laughs> oh, no, that, that's okay. My question was somewhat um, vague or somewhat difficult to answer anyway, because I was just, I read that part and in reading your book, I tried to put my mind in a Russian person's mind. And I tried to think, like, what are your thought processes that you're going into this feeling that you're doing something wrong? which seems to be suggested by the fact that they take off the crucifix and they, they cover all the icons and everything, yeah. but you're still accepting that you're going to do it anyway. I just find that because like here in, in, in my life, anyway, if I do something wrong, I at least kind of lie to myself before oh, yeah. that yes. afterwards, yes. it could be like, Oh, it just <laughs> happened. But mm -hmm. it's like, it's like, they don't lie to them. It's like they accept that they are going to do it. And it's almost inevitable that they're going to do this, Sinful oh. thing. Well, yeah. we, uh, pro probably at that time, the the church had had very very strict rules about about sexual love. It was hedged about with all all kinds of rules and prohibitions that you weren't allowed to make love on certain days and um, you know and, and all of that. Um, so that the, there was there was this kind of tension because in in their and what what they, what the church said and what they actually did in their in their in their in their daily lives were, were two different things, and uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I think there was, I think they were aware that there, that there was this tension, and um, so maybe they were sort of. Um, Trying to placate, uh, I don't know. <laughs> trying, trying to 
have it in a way to in a way to have it both ways. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh. Yeah. That's something I was thinking about. Okay. And so also mm-hmm. Rasputin. You can't talk about uh, Russian spiritual history of any kind without no. Rasputin. He's always this towering figure. And um, you you talk about that he was part of a sect called the Clists. Clisty, yes. Clisty, yeah. Clisty, and yeah. uh, one of their core beliefs was so interesting to me that to to experience forgiveness you have to sin, and so like they oh. would sin in order to experience forgiveness. And it reminded me of a book I read about Rasputin some time ago, where apparently some of the you know they would send in the secret police. I don't think they were called the KGB at that point, but they would send in the secret police to go in and talk to these prostitutes that Rasputin would go to see. And some of the prostitutes claimed that he never touched them, that he would ask them to take their clothes off and he would sit there and kind of allow himself to be tempted and then just get up and leave. And so, yeah, I I was wondering, do you think that the Clist perspective, Clisty perspective continued to influence Rasputin? And um, do you think he was a sincere spiritual person or was he just a full blown con artist? No, no, he was, he was definitely sincere. Okay. He's definitely a very, very sincere and very devout um, Orthodox Christian. Um, I mean, he, he, he walked all the way from Russia to Mount Athos in Greece. And uh, <laughs> I mean, you, d- you don't do that if you're a con artist. Right. Um, and he, he, had a, he had immense personal charisma and he had... He had gifts as a healer. Um, so, uh, yeah, he was, he was definitely completely genuine, but um, he was sort of, he was, he was fallible. And I think, uh, I think there is a tr- tradition in, in Russia of the, these, these characters who um, behave in, in a sort of, and antinomian way, you know, de- de- deliberately breaking the rules. Hmm. Um, and why? Why do you think that is? Uh, well, it's it's something that, that you you get in other in other religious traditions as as well. That um, you 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 also, you also get it among the the Cathars, the, the Cathars in France, who. Um, um, they, 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 they were very, very sort of um, uh, puritanical about about sexual matters, and took took the view that it's better if you you, if you never never had sex at all. <laughs> um, but um, they would sometimes uh, go to the opposite extreme and, and, and indulge in great sexual orgies. Um, so, uh, 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 with, uh, on, on the argument that um, by by doing that, they, they in, in a way freed themselves. They freed themselves from uh, from sin. Hmm. Yeah. It, another part about the Rasputin story that you mentioned that I, I had never heard before. He's well known for being able to get the Tsar's son to um, stop bleeding. Yeah. He, yeah. Hemophilia, but um, you talk about in the book how he was not the first person to do that. That there's is actually part of like Russian folk medicine that yeah, people yeah. use tones of voice to um, get yeah. people to stop bleeding and to feel less pain and all of those. Yes, yes exactly. Yes, this this is something that may have he may, he may have got from the shamans. Hmm. Is is that still a practice that's going around today that we know about? Um, well, I, there may there may be, but I, I don't have any uh, knowledge about that, so I can't can't really answer that. Okay, but um, but certainly the the tradition of folk medicine is is very strong in Russia. Um, at least uh, w- when I was there a few years ago, there was um, a folk healer in, in nearly every village uh, who would 
you know, know, know all about um, treating people with herbs and and so on. And um, I met met one uh, one such person who um, had a book that was sort of a a, a mixture of a, a grimoire mm. um, with all kinds of magical spells and um, a book of remedies. Like like a, just an internal like village book that was passed yeah. on. Or? Well, you know, I don't know quite where where he'd got it, but uh, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. And that's um, something people think of America as the melting pot, but something I really came right away from by reading the book was Russia has an incredibly diverse oh yeah nation yeah, of cultures and languages and uh, absolutely yes yes. Mm-hmm. But all right, so coming to the the hour of your time, I appreciate it. <laughs> the last question I would ask. So right now, Russia, Russian people, they're being completely overshadowed by political situation that's going on that we all, yeah. we all know about. Um, right. But beyond the politics, which you know, Russian people can't really you can't do anything about it, right? Just like none of us can really do much about what our politicians choose to do. Yeah. Um, how what do you want people to know about the Russian um spirit and their um spirituality specifically? Because that's obviously what your book is about. Um, mm-hmm. if you were to discuss their general character, their spiritual character, how would you characterize it? Well, I, I would say the the main th- the main thing that uh, has always struck me about the Russians is that they they have a, a belief in <clears throat> absolute values like um, <coughs> truth, truth, beauty, wisdom. I mean, these are things that they they really believe in. Um, I mean, to take the concept of beauty, for example, I mean, how often do you hear people in the West, how often do you hear artists or filmmakers or, or um, writers talking about beauty? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a word that's, that's very fashionable. Right. But um, in Russia, it's still um, something that, people strive for and um, as I was read uh, I read not long ago an interview with the film director Tarkovsky in which he was talking about this and he, he, he was saying uh, well the, the point of making films is to um, up, uplift people and promote beauty and he said um, that the trouble with an artist like Picasso for example was that he Instead of instead of, of uh, uh, nourishing beauty, he betrayed it. Mm. Um, so um, you, you 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 this is this is something that that you sense when you when you come into contact with Russians. Mm. Um, and um, another thing I, I would say, they. There's a, a kind of inter- interface between science and, and religion in Russia. Um, there's very, very interesting research going on. Um, there's a, <clears throat> an institute in um, Novosibirsk. Um, called, it's called, the, the, it has a very um, cumbersome title. I think it's called something like the Institute for uh, planetary, planetos, cos, planeto cosmic something and uh, and um, ecology. Um, and it's a very very interesting research going on there, which is sort of on the on the interface between science and, and spirituality. Hmm. Um, and uh, the, the way that um, doctors are. Are working with shamans, shamanic healers, and um, shamanic uh, medical practitioners. The way there's an, in, an interchange going on there, 
Mm. Um, so I, I think that's that, that's something that's a very fruitful kind of uh, combination that's uh, that's going on there. Um, one 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 thing I I say I think I forget whether it was in in uh, that book or in an, in another book that um, they have a sense of enchantment. Um, you can see that in the in those paintings of in those hyperborean scenes, right? Um, and in the you know in, in the folk art in Russia in the, the music and, and everything, there's a there's a kind of enchantment that is there, um, which I think it's uh, a lot of people in the West feel a lack of. Yes, I mean that. They can find it to some extent in um, in the Harry Potter books and movies and and Tolkien and so on, but um, it's not something that's that's woven into the culture the way it is in in Russia. Mm. Um, so I, I think the, the <clears throat> these are all things that um, that Russia has to offer. Mm. Yeah, I, I've noticed a lot of people are becoming interested in Orthodox uh, <clears throat> Christian ideas, and I think it's because they still hold on to a kind of mysticism that yes. you, you don't get if you go to like a local Baptist church or a Catholic church or something. You know, there's a yeah. <clears throat> there's this sense that like God is an actual active force at every moment in our lives. It's not something yeah. that happened 2,000 years ago, and now you have to wait a couple more thousand, and maybe you'll see it again, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, right. yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they have a very deep religiosity. I mean, I remember somebody told me that um, there was a, a belt of the Virgin Mary, which was uh, uh, on display in Moscow, and Thousands of people turned out and, and lined up to see this uh, in sub-zero temperatures. Um, I, can't, I can't imagine that happening with a <laughs> happening right. in the West. <laughs> right. Whether, whether it was a genuine belt or not, they, they believed that it was. And hmm. uh, when, when year did that happen? Or roughly? Well, rough, not, rough. well not, not long ago, maybe... Um, Maybe ten years ago or so. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I did see that part in the book, but I didn't. I didn't absorb the specifics of it. That's really fascinating. You do yeah. mention that. You do mention it yeah. in the book. But that is a uh, huh. That's interesting. And so, yeah, I, and I think that is a valuable thing that I really wanted people to. I would people people. You need to read the book. It's a yeah. it's I, it's a great book. And uh, you do come away with, as you just said, this understanding of how deeply spiritual Russian people are. And it's it's so weird to me that you have deeply spiritual pagans and deeply spiritual Orthodox yes, thinkers yes. that are side by side in some places almost kind of mingling. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Because you wouldn't see that here. Like, you're not going to see uh, my minister at my local church isn't going to hang out with the Wiccans, uh, you know what I mean, and, and talk about the how they're, they both might be delving into the same thing, even though they're coming at it from different directions. Yes, yes. But the, although I do wonder if Russia does continue to evolve, if in the Orthodox Church continues with its relationship with the state, which you mentioned in the book, a lot of people don't like how close the – Orthodox mm. Church in the state is getting. I do wonder if eventually that's going to come to the point where they start pushing out paganism again. But that's total, mm. total guesswork. You know, just uh, after reading your book, I really tried to think into the future of how this could all manifest if this if this is all going to really come true. And I tried to visualize it, and mm. uh, <clears throat> that was one of the things I was just wondering how that would turn out in the end. Mm. But. Uh, yeah. And so, in addition to uh, Occult Russia, mm. do you have any other works that you uh, would like to tell people about or just anything else going on? Well, I've uh, written a book called Occult Germany, which is, um, in, in, in some sense, a sort of follow-up to Occult Russia. Um, 
So that'll, that'll be coming out also within Traditions. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I guess prob- probably sometime towards the end of next year. Fantastic. I'll be the first in line for that one. <laughs> Very good. Very mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, because the two, the Russian story and the German story kind of interlace in your story, your personal story very much. Oh, very much. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, and so, again, Cold Russia, everybody needs to buy the book. It's, it's, I read this. This is what I do. I read books like this, and this is one of the most interesting books I've read in a while. It's, I think it's fantastic. So, um Thank you very much, Chris. I, this was a pleasure and an honor. I really appreciate it. And um, You're welcome. Yeah, do you have anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? Um, I don't think so. No? It's good uh, to go? It's been a great pleasure talking to you, Jeff. All right. Thank you very much, sir. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, and I, I will be, I do hope to hear from you after you finish Dead Souls. I do hope to hear about your final thoughts. Oh, on that. oh definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it. And um, have a great week. You too. Bye. Bye, sir.